Welcome to the 47th episode of the Liz McMullen Show. I am welcoming a quite fine writer, Quinn Masters. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's great to be here with you. Yay! Yay! (laughs) How are you doing this mighty fine day? Great. Wonderful. And how are you? I am very good. I'm a busy bee, um, but getting stuff done. So what got you into writing lesbian fiction? Well, um, it had a lot to do with uh, discovering, getting in touch with my, my own sexuality. I am a trans woman, so uh, it had a lot to do with self-discovery and uh, uh, just a, a self-exploration. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I think I think that's the best way to put it. Mm-hmm. So, when you, when you were what what were the things that you were reading before you started writing stuff? Um, well, uh, various uh, authors, um, R.E. Bradshaw and uh, Lynn Ames, mm-hmm. and. Uh, Radcliffe uh, are some some of my favorites. Mm-hmm. What do you look for when you're you're looking for a good read? What's some things that are pleasing to you? Um, I like uh, strong characters, but characters that uh, that also have uh, a vulnerability. So they have to they, they have to have that in my mind for uh, a, a depth and. Uh, and also, I, I, I enjoy stories that are unusual in a way. And when I write stories of my own, I, I try to think of, of stories that are unique to some degree. Mm-hmm. And uh, they may not be completely unique in the world, but at least they're unique to me, if that makes any sense. I am on board with you completely because I like when books make a departure uh, from whatever's the more common um, plot arcs, you know, fairly simplified or, you know, just Harlequin-esque or just not rich enough. And I think in order for something to be a good book, there has to be some meat behind it, something that makes it unique and compelling. Right. Agreed. Uh, another aspect, uh, that I like is, is, is stories that, um, that are real world. So I'm, I'm not drawn to the paranormal Mm -hmm. or science fiction, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, I like stories that could happen to somebody that, uh, you know, you know, um, real people. Mm-hmm. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we have two very different books that I'm reviewing for this evening. And first, I'm going to start with the book that you got me very mad at you with. And it was Path Not Chosen. How dare you make me cry? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you horrible woman. <laughs> well, um, I, I would apologize to you, but of course, as an author, those are that's music to my ears. <laughs> you cruel person! <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, and and there's something else um, conspicuous about your writing, Quinn. What is that? <laughs> <I'm> intrigued. <laughs> Lots and lots and lots of sex. <laughs> that is true. In the in the first two books, there there's a lot of sex, and and I actually didn't know, uh, didn't realize how much there was, uh, and and I've made a conscious decision to to dial it down mm-hmm. as I move forward because I I do want to focus more on the stories. Yeah, that the one thing that got me, like, I, well, first of all, 
in terms of erotic sort, you know, elements, like they're all very well, very well written and unique and not repetitive. And, you know, there's nothing worse than I had, I had this fantastic author who wrote, wrote dismal sex scenes in her books. And it was like, you know, fondle the right breast, play with the left nip. <laughs> you know, it, like each sex scene like had some kind of repetitiveness to it. And I was like, this is terrible. Um, but when I was reading The Path Not Chosen, um, when Paige and Alyssa, they start out as roommates. Right. You may not like sci-fi, but you did something very unique with Alyssa. Uh-huh. And she has, like, an, an allergy to natural fibers. Right. So how does that work, and how did you come up with that? Um, I don't remember. That was one of the earliest um, aspects of the book that I had, and it was uh, something that, um, that d- was intended to draw the characters kind of together. Uh, Alyssa was supposed to be this uh, this kind of ideal, you know, mate for for Paige, uh, but she had this 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 fatal flaw that kind of made her this kind of outcast. And I could I I was I had this idea. Um, about about this 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 allergy, and, and then I I actually decided that I really didn't like it, mm-hmm. and uh, it, for a number of months I actually tried to come up with alternatives, mm-hmm. and I could I just could not think of anything that worked as well. I mean, she she her the first impression that Paige has when uh, she sees this is like, oh my god. This woman right. is flawless. She's gorgeous and perfect. We know who's going to be going on at all, all the dates. And, you know, we're probably not going to fit in. It's going to be high school and mean girls and awful. And it turns out that she has this allergy, which means that, you know, she's allergic to natural fiber. So she has all this uniquely made clothing uh, out of forms of um, plastic and latex that, you know, that she can have against her skin. So even though she was this knockout, Everybody made fun of her because of the things that she could not wear. Right. That's right. So, I mean, it, it, it was, you know, a very unique thing. The other thing I was not expecting, but I understand because it comes from being very self-conscious, is I was not expecting Paige to be such a jealous person. Oh. Right. And well, and that came out of just the the expression of the of the depth of her devotion mm-hmm. to to Alyssa, and um, and it comes up a number of times actually, doesn't a, it? A bunch of times, and you know, when I was first re- as I read it and was thinking about it, you know, I could I could. The way you wrote it is you, I could understand why she was getting jealous. And then now thinking back, you know, it's taking a step back. These are children. These are college kids. Right. And even though um, they're not literally kids, you know, they're also not experienced with you know dating and the community and everything that goes along with being in um an intimate relationship they don't have a lot of the same what's it called they don't have a lot of the same background i guess sometimes that straight people have uh because they have more experience uh with you know how to interact and whatnot and so um Paige, you know, doesn't understand why Alyssa is not making um, bigger boundaries with um, with her friend from high school. Right, that's right, and with with the men that she meets. Yeah, so like with Greta, I was like, what the fuck? I was like, oh, you're gonna have private conversations off to the side, or you know, take the cell phone off to the side to talk, and and but at the same time. 
you know, there's a level of judgmentalness, I guess, because we get used to reading lesbian romances and we want people to act perfectly and, you know, uh, behave in a, with a way of loyalty and, and strength and whatnot. And I was like, well, you know, trust. Exactly. Alyssa yeah. could be somewhat ambivalent. She could be very much in love with Paige and not want to stray from Paige. But at the same time, you know, Greta is somebody that she knew from before. And there's something going on. Even if she wasn't going to uh, cheat, there was something that was drawing her to that. And I was like, you know, not the best choices. And you could, you could actually make people notice that, um, we are a couple and not like guys flirt with you and all that kind of stuff. And I was just like, but you know, Alyssa, as mature as she is, she's still a kid. That's right. And they're both coming into their sexuality as well. So these are, these are people that perhaps were, were friends and in a very platonic sense before, but uh, but now they, they those boundaries are, are completely different now mm-hmm. than they were before. Mm-hmm. And another aspect um, is that uh, uh, Paige is very mature in certain ways, but she is she acts fairly immature in her jealousy. Mm-hmm. And it, it's it's this kind of um, it's this this aspect of her personality that I I kind of give her. Um, just to to humanize her a bit, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, you did some really great teenage angst stuff, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I you know, it's it's not letting the cat out of the bag because they do become romantic partners. But um, right. the angst that she was going through first when she figured out that she liked her and talking to the priest and then talking to her academic advisor and then all the angst she was going through, like, how am I going to tell her? And then it does not go well at all. And she's like, how am I ever going to go with I was like, that is so on point with how teenagers think. <laughs> Yeah. It is the end of the world. <laughs> I remember this is me in in college when um when you know I was I was dating men at the time. It was the first guy I was ever with and I'm never going to be I love him but I'm never going to be with anybody ever again. Yeah. And I was like, uh-huh. I think you can all relate to that to some degree. Yeah, and then I turned into a big old lesbian and and I certainly was not chased in any way. <laughs> shape or form I was like I guess huh I guess it wasn't the end of the world now was it but when you're (laughs) got those like adolescent hormones and all sorts of shit going on it also makes you a little bit illogical too I mean even as adults you know um sexual attraction and and other kind of stuff and baggage and hang-ups and insecurities get in the way as well but when you're you're a teenager a college student you're just learning how to be an adult Never mind um, this other kind of stuff. Yeah, and it can it can take a lot of adventures to uh, to get through that and to to understand you know how little all of those events really mean, mm-hmm. and that uh, you're you're really destined for something better that may not come along for a long time. Mm-hmm. You know, I've only read two of your books, but I was. I was wondering if it, it's true in others. At the end, you have either like an epilogue or, you know, a few chapters that really ties up a happy ending. Is, is that some, you know, almost like a long-term happy ending? Is that something that you often do in your books? It is. It's, that's interesting. Uh, so... Um, it, it it was in this in my second book, and then in my my third book, I did not originally have that, um, but it it became kind of a bone of contention. Um, I had some feedback that indicated that I really needed that, and mm-hmm. so um, the 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 ending was rewritten uh, a few times, and uh, the final ending does have that, mm-hmm. although I don't feel that necessarily every book should and I and I do have some stories planned uh that certainly 
don't have it and some that don't even necessarily end well. Yeah. And um, what, I, what I also thought was uh, well done, um, there was a point where you dropped the bomb about the house that they're living in that they decided, oh, yes. they decided you know, that they needed off-campus housing. And you made a comment about, you know, if we knew what the house was going to mean, we wouldn't have stayed. And I was thinking, because earlier in the book, there was some uh, date attempted rape that happened to Alyssa. Uh, uh And also uh, some other, like, and then there was some uh, gay bashing experiences, well, one in particular, that I'm thinking, okay, they've, they've left the dorm to kind of, distance themselves from some gay bashing. Right. And then I was like, oh, my God. It's like they're going to be this awful, like, um, like a stalker or somebody who who lives in their complex. And so that's where my brain went. And obviously that's not how the book ends or, you know, the, the, you know, the real stressful part of the book. But I, that's what I was thinking. And, and the reason why I think it, it was a good... Um, plant is that it was a misdirect um, depending on interpretation of the person but it also planted the seed that something about this place is going to have a huge impact later on that if they ha- could do things again they would have done things differently right so that was a really good plant well thank you thank you that certainly in- intended to be a foreshadow I didn't realize that uh, that it was uh it was so ambiguous that uh well i didn't realize the ambiguity until i saw the end (laughs) but i had already had in my head um from earlier in the book the um you know off off camera things that happened to Alyssa with the guys that she slept with previously and then, like, this guy who she goes out on a date with and, you know, he gets close to to forcing her all the way, but she ends up being able to run away and be okay. Um, right. So I'm, the two things I'm thinking of when they move into that apartment complex is, like, gay bashing or, you know, you know some kind of other type of violence. And I was just like, oh, God, what's going to happen? Because <laughs> you know, out of the out, out of the frying pan into the fire. So I was like, "What the hell? What are you going to do to that? What are you going to do to that?" <laughs> <laughs> yes, and they and they do go through their trials. Oh my god! You know, and it's so it's so funny because I feel like once they after we got through the angst at the beginning and they finally figured out that they were going to try and give it a go, there was just so much sex. <laughs> <laughs> it was it, it was it was you know it fit and it was a part it, it's definitely that was definitely reality honestly from my recollections of my body teenage and early 20s stage where a lot of your relationship is you know external influences and also how that you continue to work through the passion that they have together and, and I was thinking to myself because I at first, I was like, oh, this is great. And then there was so much of it, and I was like, hmm, where the fuck is this going? And then you did some awful things and made me cry. Because, <laughs> you, you know, I was like, all right, they've been in Shangri-La for a really long time with fantastic sex. That's great. And, and there's some jealousy issues, but I'm like, what is going to keep this book moving? I was very concerned about it. And, oh. then, and then you had, you know, the bomb. <laughs> Which, you know, uh-huh. everybody's going to have to read to find out because I can't tell you because you have to be as disturbed as I was and, 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 and muddle through the rest of it hoping against hope that something good will happen, you know. Someday my prince will come. Just kidding. Um, but, yeah, I was like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Woman, what do you do? <laughs> Well, I'm glad that uh, that it found found the end that you were looking for. At least it needed, you know. This this is something um, experienced authors or aspiring authors or whatever, whomever is listening and paying attention, 
You have to be very pointed with how the plot is going to progress. You have to keep somebody on board with you. Otherwise, after a certain point, people feel like turning off the book, like almost like turning off the TV. Right, right. And like it still managed to be a page turner and there was a lot of different things that they were struggling with that were happening. But if it continued on that way... Um, and did not have that awful thing happen, then it just would have fallen apart, so to speak. It was it was borderline. Yeah, it. I mean, it was not. I mean, it, I I had only felt that way, I guess, about a chapter or a couple of chapters before the the change of events. Okay. And so, I mean, it, I enjoy the book, and I, I, you know, I recommend it to other folks, but just from my perspective, I was like, all right, we need to be doing something else. As, as, as uh-huh. fun as it is to watch them in their sexual experimentation, and they're quite daring, um, it was, what really came down to it was, was, uh, was that turning point where things got very serious and it was no longer about petty jealousies. It, it was something very serious. And I, that's what rescued the book because I, I loved it and enjoyed it, but I was concerned. And sometimes when I'm reading a book, let's say there are other authors who have intimacy that happens just way too soon. And, and I, you know, I've told folks, I said, unless you figure out another really good form of tension to keep people turning the pages, you yeah. know, they're going to put down their book. And they're, they're, I'm not going to mention who the author is, but I was reading and then, you know, maybe a chapter or so into the book, there was, you know, sex and love and they loved each other madly. And I was like, what the fuck is this? I mean, not that it can't happen in real life. But books have to function differently. Right. There, there has to be tension. There has to be uh, a, a dilemma. Mm-hmm. If there's no... That, I was like, what the hell is... You know, when it happens to us, I was like, I'm on page 20. What the fuck are you going to do for the rest of the book to make this work? You know? Right. And then well, things did happen. But if I, if I, if I, as you know, I read a lot, I'm sure there are also folks that don't read as much and they're like, what is this? In, in a way, the book, this book is, is an experiment um, in, in the sense that, you know, could I write a book in which the, the two romantic characters do get together early in the book? Mm-hmm. And, um, and I think that, that it, it actually did work pretty well. And, and my second book is, is also an experiment in the sense that uh, I, I spend a large portion of the book in in a character sketch and the romantic characters don't even meet till later in the book. Mm -hmm. So if I can think of something interesting to do, I like, I like to do those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, what I, I really liked about it because there's sometimes I don't, I don't know what the the chemistry or, or the right elements are. And I'll, I'll tell you what confuses the fuck out of me. I have read entire um, things that were specifically erotic romances. I've read books that have a high volume of sex scenes, and they're well-written, but I don't know why they don't turn me on. (laughs) I was like, what is missing here? Because, you know, there's this one author, and and it's like I read the stuff, and all the right elements and body parts are there. Um, there's enough interesting chemistry and going on, but it falls flat. And the opposite is true for yours. It's just like, you know, I, I'm surprised my husband made it through last night whole. <laughs> because I was, re- I was like, oh. <laughs> so even from a literary standpoint, I was like, when are we going to get to something really dramatic? From from a personal standpoint, I was like, high five. <laughs> wow. Of course, like, I'm blushing because I'm a, I'm a hoe. I can't believe I talk about these things. <laughs> but that, that was fantastic. I really, I mean, I really enjoyed Path Not Chosen. And... 
What I also liked about it was that we start with Paige, who's a very devout Christian. Uh-huh. And, you know, she she's from a certain background in the, at that she's very tortured by being interested in a woman. But at the same time, what I really liked about her was that she was not sexually stymied. Like, she knew that, you know, she stopped judging what fantasies she had in her head when she, you know, when she was stimulating herself. And I was like, you go, girlfriends. Because <laughs> she's not completely repressed. She just doesn't know how to reconcile her faith and her homosexuality, which she doesn't even really, even though she's doing the deed, she doesn't really see her that self that way. And even wow. when she goes to, you know, those groups, she's not sure that she belongs there. But to some degree, she, she certainly is repressed. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, she's, she's kind of been fr- from this background and, Yet she comes into this university environment where she has these these new influences, which are more liberal and accepting, mm-hmm. and so she kind of walks this line as she's coming into her sexuality. So she has these two influences that you know you meet the the priest and the the professor, mm-hmm. and so you know you kind of I can kind of impart hopefully the sense that you know she could have gone either way. Yeah. And she could have, you know, she has this this man that she dates, and and she could have possibly married him, and you know, and she wonders what her life would have been like. It's like on paper he looks great. I don't know why I don't exactly. feel anything for him. Right, exactly. You know, all the all the all the criteria are there. So why? Where's the chemistry? Why am I not feeling it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also. One one of the things that, when I was in college, there was a lot of prejudice against uh, women who like women who have, who can pass as straight, uh-huh. who appear feminine, who are like are not inextricably linked to their ho- uh, homosexuality. For example. My first girlfriend, um, well, she, I don't consider her a lesbian, but she had, like, long, blonde, waist blonde hair, and she was French and very cultured and chic and smelled wonderful, right? <laughs> and so you, other than her just being so open sexually, you would never, you know, paint her in that box. And then my first serious girlfriend, Gloria, was what I call, like, a little mighty mite. She was 5'2". Very, very, very muscular, uh, very built. Um, but walking with her marked uh-huh. me as a lesbian. Okay. Because she, you can't, there was no unlesbining her. <laughs> she was right. like this little butch thing, and there was just yeah. no, it was like, you know, blaring, blue doo, blue doo, you know. And so for Alyssa, she's a knockout. So it would never occur to these men that could, she could possibly not be batting for their team. Right, exactly. But what do you mean? I'm a lesbian. But what? This is my girlfriend. Oh, okay. This is my girl. You know, so I could see her. I could see why Paige would get frustrated and just like lay one kiss on her and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and then it blows up. I know, (laughs) kablooey. So we're going to transition to Bridge Over Sorrows. So can you give me a little blurb about the story, and then you're going to do a reading. Okay. Go ahead. Well, this is, uh, it's a little bit tricky to uh, avoid uh, giving a spoiler here, but... uh, because there is kind of a a, a, um, a mystery being woven, but essentially this is a, a story about um, a, a young woman named Shanti who um, is a, an Indian Canadian, and uh, she finds herself on the run from her family who is pursuing her uh, 
because they uh, have betrothed her to a man that she does not want to marry mm-hmm. uh, because she is uh, she is gay, and uh, so she finds herself. Um, um, it, uh, in a, a small town where she is discovered and then she uh, ends up basically uh, um, in, a, in a situation where she uh, ends up getting lost in, in the woods and, and injured. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she is at the mercy of a, of a strange hermit. Mm-hmm. And the mystery is all about, uh, you know, who this person is and, and, uh, and um, kind of... What brought them, like, this, yeah. the, the recluse is, is, is Mati, and she, she's like a mountain woman, I guess, and hasn't really spoken to anybody in quite some time and is not comfortable having... Um, Shanti around, but Shanti has no choice. She's injured, and uh, she's they're too far from civilization for her to just easily, you know, get to a hospital. So she has to convalesce and figure out how the heck she's going to get back. The reading that you're going to do uh, from whose story are you going to be telling this brief intro? I will be telling the uh, the uh, story of uh, of Maddie from the very beginning. Oasis. The black night was a peaceful dark that only remote wilderness could offer, illuminated by the dimmest starlight. The ambient chirps of crickets and croaks of frogs filled the meadow. I want to see them again. A light clicked on inside the tent. A groan. Really? I'm tired. We can sleep in. You always say that. Then you're always up at the crack of dawn. Maddie dug beside her pillow and retrieved a strip of grayscale photos. She sat up, reaching over to the lamp, which hung from the center of the tent. She attached the strip to a a clip on its underside. As she did so, her partner retreated to the far side of the double-wide sleeping bag they shared, huddling her gaunt frame against the edge for heat. Ooh, it's cold! She rubbed her shoulders vigorously. Maddie's exposed breath swung to and fro as she struggled to secure the paper, her rosy cheeks even more so in the cold air. Cheryl, peeking from the warmth of her sanctuary, said, You dork, that's not going to work. Sure enough, the light shone perpendicular to the paper and did not illuminate the images on it. Maddie blew hair off her face in a show of frustration and turned upon Cheryl in the shoulder. Dork. Cheryl smiled, smiled sleepy eyes in victory. Maddie removed the paper, held it behind the light, then examined the details. There's the face, she she mumbled, pointing. You can see the nose behind the eyes. Even though they'd scrutinized the photos all day, Cheryl couldn't help but take interest. She looked up, but not enough to venture from her covers. There's the arm, and there are the legs, and the little coffee bean. She smiled and almost giggled at Cheryl. I'm so glad it's Lydia, not Oliver. I was going to have to put my foot down on that one. Yeah, whatever. Cheryl rolled her eyes. Can we go to sleep now? Maddie pursed her lips. I want to say goodnight one more time. Cheryl moaned. Not again. I'm really tired. Really quick, I promise. Cheryl hesitated, then threw back the sleeping bag and clumsily sat up, revealing her naked pregnant form. Maddie sidled up to her plump belly. Hello, little Olivia. This is Mama Maddie. She placed her hand on Cheryl's belly and rubbed her cheeks against her taut flesh. Are you awake? What are you thinking in there? Pause. What kind of person are you going to be? What are you going to do when you grow up? Stop that. What? Stop talking like that, like she's already grown up and moving out. She's just a baby. Let her be a baby for a while. I just like imagining your life and all the things she might do someday. Maddie sighed. Okay, I love you. Mama Cheryl loves you. Sleep tight, little baby. Oh, did you feel that? Yes, she kicked. Maddie grinned like a kid on Christmas morning. That's only the second time for me. She's most active at night. 
That kick's a bonus. Shell paused to enjoy the delight in Maddie's eyes as she waited in giddy expectation for another event. She smiled and rubbed Maddie's hair. Is that good enough? Just one more minute. Maybe she'll kick again. Maddie waited, then adjusted her, adjusted her hand and waited some more. I'm cold already. Can we go to sleep? Shell slid back into the bag, lying on her side, her back to Maddie. You owe me some serious snuggling. Maddie moved into position behind Cheryl's shivering body and pulled the bag snugly over them. You know it wouldn't be so bad if you didn't make me sleep in the nude. It's good for you, Maddie protested. It's natural, and we can share body heat this way. Plus, it helps air out your muff at night. What? <laughs> Cheryl huffed. I think you made that up that last part. No, it's true. You have no ulterior motive? In her privacy behind Cheryl's hair, Maddie broke a wild, guilty smile. Is that so bad? This is nice, isn't it? Maddie pulled Cheryl tightly against her. Despite her claims, Cheryl felt as warm as a toaster oven. Maddie inserted her arm under Cheryl's side and held her pregnant belly. Her other hand roamed Cheryl's smooth leg, posterior hip, and came to rest on her breast. Her hand gently rounded, traced, and caressed Cheryl's soft, sensitive skin. Cheryl's deep breaths signaled to Maddie that her advances were well appreciated. Turn out the light. Oh, right. The light clicked off again. Kissing joined frogs and crickets in nature's cacophony. Calamity. I want two. Get one and eat the carrots in the truck. Cheryl stared at the bag of chips calling to her from the rack. I know. I've been eating like crap lately. That's one of the reasons I took you on this trip. You mean kidnapped me. You've been hibernating. You need to get some exercise, get back to the mountains, and get some fresh air. No, I mean I've been suffering withdrawal myself. I know. Okay, only one. She took the bag of chips and walked it to the counter with her Gatorade. Maddie got trail mix and water. Maddie threw the goods in the dirt on the dirty truck seat and climbed into the ancient Ford F-100 next to Cheryl. The rusty engine roared to life. Maddie backed away from the store and angled for the highway. Just as she slowed to change out of reverse, a huge crunch made the dumb both jump. Maddie opened her door and leaned out to see a huge motorcycle behind them. Her truck injected into its exhaust pipes, the polished metal sheen deformed like crumpled paper under its rusty bumper. Oh shit, she looked at Cheryl. It's bikers. Cheryl looked distressed. It's okay. It was an accident, right? I don't know. I guess it depends on the bikers. You bitch! You bash my pipes! Maddie turned to see a mountain of a man standing at the door store door with a bag in his hands, his long greasy hair tamed only by a red bandana over his forehead. Denim and leather rippled over generous muscles. To Maddie it appeared that he hadn't bathed for a decade. He stared at her, nostrils flared, teeth bared. He was pissed. Maddie panicked. She threw the shifter into first and floored it. Are you sure we shouldn't talk to them? Maddie didn't answer. She glanced to the left and spun rubber as the Ford hit asphalt. Some little relief settled in her as the convenience store shrunk into the rearview mirror, but it was short-lived. Like wasps swarming to the attack, Maddie squinted to see the tiny motorcycles taking to the highway. One, two, three. Here they come, said Cheryl. Four, five, six, seven. Maddie hit the gas. It didn't matter how fast now. Eight, nine. Maddie focused on the road. The speedometer climbed. Fifty, sixty, seventy, seventy-five. They're gaining. A glimpse in the mirror shocked Maddie. They were on the truck already. Maddie gulped it as the road twisted to evade the truck's course. She slammed on the brakes and pulled the wheel as Cheryl braced herself against the door and the dashboard, wide-eyed. The truck tipped, veered to enter the curves. Cheryl yelped. Like a racer set on the checkered flag, Maddie gripped the wheel and focused on the road, calculating the maximum speed allowable for each turn. With curve after curve, the bikers were trapped behind, clinging to the Ford's bumper like slathering hyenas. We can't outrun them, said Cheryl. No, but we have plenty of gas. We need to keep moving and get to a town and a police station. Okay. 
The curves tightened, forcing Maddie to slow. The motorcycles roared in seething anger just behind. Maddie snuck a quick glance at Cheryl, who was staring back at her. I'm really scared. It's going to be okay, Cher. Maddie tensed and hit the brakes again as a sudden tight curve swung up on her. Orange signs flew, flew past way too late. She felt one, two thumps on the Ford's thick bumper from bikers following too closely. Then the road crossed a bridge and opened into a long climbing straightaway. Maddie floored it again, and the creaky engine responded with a deep ch chugging and a spew of black smoke in the faces of their pursuers. Cheryl sat up straight and shifted in her seat, visibly panicked. Maddie leaned forward into the steering wheel in a vain attempt to push the truck forward, but it was no use. Two bikers flew in front of the truck like shots from a cannon. The long-haired bandana biker pulled alongside and pointed his finger at Maddie. Pull over! Maddie glanced between them and the road, unsure of what to do. Pointing at her with a very intimidating finger, Pull over, you stupid stuck bitch, or I'll kill you dead. A wave of fear fell over Maddie's body with a shudder. She felt her muscles weaken as she forced herself to ignore the monster only a few feet outside her window and focused on the road. Again, the slope of the forge... Against the slope, the forge struggled to top 45... She noticed the bandana biker moving ahead and out of the corner of her eye, another one moved into position beside her, very close. He procured something from the far side of his motorcycle. She looked closer to see at what task he was working so intently. Part of his implement, a handle, he had in his hand, and part was hidden on the far side of his bike. Suddenly, with a motion that could have only been honed over years of practice, he swung a chain with something heavy on the end over his bike, balancing all, so that its ends, end weight struck Maddie's windshield. The end weight broke through and shattered the glass in a spiderweb crack from end to end. Instinctively, Maddie shrieked and flung her hands over her face. The steering wheel suddenly loose, the truck drifted to the right and off the highway. Maddie uncovered her eyes. The glass had cracked, but not broken. She grabbed the wheel and tried to correct her trajectory. Maddie turned the wheel, hard left, and pushed down on the gas, desperately trying to get the Ford to grip on the loose soil of the road shoulder. The whack of a mile marker flattened under the truck filled the cabin. At last, she fought her way back to the pavement. But at her sharp angle, the engine screaming. When the rubber hit the road, it connected and shot them across instantly. They flew through the air to the other side then between trees until the Ford made a direct connection with a stout trunk and came to a sudden halt. Time seeped by in a blur. Maddie felt the sticky of her arms rub against her face. Her head hurt dull. Breaths came slowly. There was a click and a metallic squeal somewhere. Then she felt an arm cross her. Then another click. Then a second arm joined to grip her body and heft her wholly into the air. Her arm felt, fell from her eyes, and she saw the bikers gather around the truck. She shuddered in fright. This one done it. The hands released her, and she hit the ground. This is the one that sliced my hog. The biker with the red bandana directed his fury at Maddie. What do you got to say about that, bitch? Maddie weakly lifted her bloodied hand to her brow and sh to shield the sun. She could see that Bandana was really expecting an answer. In a wobbly voice, she said, I'm sorry, it was an accident. Oh, it was an accident. He threw up his arms and scanned his comrades in mock agreement. I guess that just makes it all better then, don't it? I can pay to have it repaired. I have almost $300. Oh, that's nice. Except those were custom pipes. That plus the extra you did is going to cost me over 2500 Do you have that stashed in your rig there, bitch? I can get it. A pair of bikers carried Cheryl motionless from the far side of the truck and laid her on the ground. Maddie's heart leapt from her chest at the sight. Cheryl was breathing and not too bloody. A quick survey gave Maddie hope that there was no obvious broken bones or severe bruising but it was impossible to tell if there was any internal damage without a closer look. Would she lose their baby? Well, I'll tell you. I'll take you 300 as a down payment. And how's that sound? 
As it turns out, I got something. You got something else I might be interested in. Maddie shielded her eyes against the sun again to see Bandana loosening his belt. One of the bikers was examining Cheryl. This one's pretty enough. No, you don't have to do this. Have to? Have to's got nothing to do with it, sister. You owe me debt, and that's got no way to pay it. I figure you're lucky you got something's worth offering. Otherwise, I'd be spilling your guts about now. The sound of the soft slaps drew Maddie's attention to Cheryl. The biker was beginning to revive her. Come on, sweets, time to play. She was squirming to consciousness. A new level of fear welled up in Maddie. Soon they'd be having their way with her sweet love, the mother of their baby. Tears of depression, of desperation, broke from her eyes. Please, begged Maddie. You don't have to do this. We'll do anything you want. Anything. Bandana squatted down to stare her in the face close enough for her to smell the chewing tobacco on his breath. He smiled wide. I know you will. Maddie's fear turned to desperation. Her gaze darted around as if she were a cornered animal, but she could find no recourse. Please. Bandana laughed at her in the most sadistic, sinister, deep voice imaginable. Cheryl's biker laid his greasy hand on her pristine white shirt. Maddie's hand found a fist-sized stone and launched it between Bandana's legs, making perfect contact. The laughter stopped and his eyes went dim as all consciousness departed. His enormous weight fell limply backward. A shock on Maddie's skull threw her to the dirt. You stupid fuck, you knocked her out. We can still have fun with this one. Aw, oh, shit, man, she's fat. That's the end. That's it. So when I read that, I had my own little personal heart attack. I was like, where is she going to go from here? <laughs> and you don't actually find out for some time. No, exactly. And I was, I was, I was just was like, wait, you have me crying, soppy mess and horrified. And what the hell is going to happen next? And oh. Uh, and then you flip into Shanti's situation. Um, but I was just like, oh. I'm glad I continued to read it. it. You know, a lot, it makes sense why um, Maddie's so shut down. But, uh, you know, I was worried that the book was going to be a downer, and it wasn't. It was, it was something very different. It was unusual, um, but it, it wasn't horrifying. It's like, how could I possibly read this book? But it, you know, it is worth reading. You just have to kind of push through. Well, it, I would say that, um, it, it definitely has a great deal of darkness, but it's balanced by a great deal of light. And, and a resurgence. And there's also a mythological kind of connection as well. Yeah. Where did you come up with that? Well, um, it just evolved as, as a kind of vehicle to the, the evolution of, of the return, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, so what can you, can you explain the mythology, um, that you put into the book? Uh, the the story, the story. Yeah. The, so the, the mythology is that um, is that there is this this kind of um, this the spirit that uh, is the spirit of the canyon that kind of guides these lost souls, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's a, a very a subtle involvement. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, it, in in um, it essentially saves saves Maddie's life and saves saves Shanti's life mm -hmm. in the beginning by guiding them into the wilderness to begin their their kind of rebirth, mm -hmm. and then also guides them in their in their kind of evolution and res and resurfacing later later on mm -hmm. um 
And for Maddie, also acts as, to some degree, as her companion. Now, it's a little bit unclear whether her, her mumblings are her are an actual connection with the spirit or if she's just kind of gone a little crazy. Mm-hmm. Well, she and hasn't seen a single person since she left civilization. And that's, that's right. Have you read other books or seen films where you found this concept appealing of, you know, ha- discovering somebody, a hermit, you know, who had been separate from the world and is, is being tugged back, you know, Usually it's a Kermergeny kind of character. Have you seen things or read things before like that? I I hadn't, actually. Um, Where do you get some of your ideas for your books? Do you, you know, does it happen, you know, on the fly? Or do you have a particular time of day that you like to sit down and work on writing? Well, um... Actually, a, a lot of um, a lot of my writing occurs in odd hours on weekends and sometimes in the middle of the night uh, when I can't sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of my ideas, I, I like um, romances that occur in the midst of desperate situations or unusual circumstances Mm -hmm. and and path is not one of those but um i have a a series of of books that i i kind of outlined and and bridge is typical of those um where two characters are brought together in just you know extreme and unusual circumstances Mm -hmm. and so that is kind of how bridge evolves um, but it's it's definitely one of one of the favorite ideas that I've had, and I kind of think of it as a reverse heart of darkness. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, other other ones where uh, maybe the characters are going through some other tribulation or have some other history, and and that brings them to a place where where perhaps um, they they are in need of this relationship to bring them out of some other struggle. Mm -hmm. But the romance is an aspect of that that other story, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Does. Do you have, um, well, we're we're in Halloween season, and I know that you don't look for writing paranormal and whatnot. What kind of, like, things that you find, do you find Halloween appealing? Um, I do. I do, but I'm, I'm more of an observer. Mm-hmm. Actually, um, my my wife has has been uh, is is an absolutely an avid bookworm, mm-hmm. and uh, she's been very involved um, with my my stories, and uh, and I enjoy bouncing ideas off of her, and uh, and we did have an, uh, we had talked through a few uh, Halloween themed ideas actually, mm-hmm. um, one of which was was simply. Uh, how dark of a, a protagonist could we find? <laughs> oh. Well, you know, I, I, you know, dark protagonists can be cool. I also have have been uh, attracted to an antihero. Huh? I'm a sucker for a redemption tale. Huh? Uh, like, uh, let's see, one of my uh, favorite authors for that is Kim Baldwin. And um, she has some stories with mercenaries in them who, you know, they obviously, since they're guns for hire, they've done sketchy things. And, um, and some, make, some of the things that they've done make them feel, you know, unredeemable ah. and unlovable yeah. and without hope. And so I love a story that gives them and uh, these characters an opportunity to redeem themselves and also to discover that against all odds, yes, they are lovable and they are loved. Not that it's a simple thing, but, you know, I I find myself attracted to that kind of stuff all the time. Like with um, Jove Bell and her book Chaps, it has... uh, 
the the bad boy, you know, the bad girl, um, uh-huh. was an enforcer for a, a drug drug kingpin. You know, and 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 the scenes in the beginning kind of remind me a little bit of Pulp Fiction, where uh, John Travolta's character goes in um, with uh-huh. Samuel Jackson, <laughs> 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 with their come to Jesus moments before they shoot folks. And uh, she finds herself escaping uh, on her motorcycle, which of course goes down in the middle of farmland. And she falls uh, in love with a cowgirl, you know, who shows up, you know, not on a white horse, but on a horse like, Do you, could you use some help? <laughs> and, you know, and, and the characters are just so <laughs> rich and fun. And I, you know, I guess... I guess I'm, I'm the type of girl who likes to see um, flawed people fall in love. Uh, you know, people who find that there's no hope or redemption, there's no way, no good deed that they could do could ever make up for all the evil things that they had done. And I like to see them proved wrong. The, my second book falls pretty squarely into that theme, actually. Mm-hmm. By the... Uh, in my second book is called A Girl Called Shine. Mm-hmm. And Shine is is definitely that, that type of anti-hero. Yeah. <laughs> it would be interesting to see what you think of, of her. Well, you'll have to, t- you know, you could always toss me, toss me the book electronically and I'll let you Absolutely. know. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I, have had, I am so excited and so pleased uh, to have you as a guest on my show. I've really enjoyed spending time with you. Me too. It's been an absolute delight.